Can everybody hear me okay? I have to warn you, my flight here affected my voice, so if at any point you stop hearing me, just make signs up. Thank you for the beautiful introduction. That's a lot of a big promise. So I, um, I want to tell you what we're confused about today, and hopefully at the end of the talk, to reiterate what was said last night at dinner, we're going to be confused at a higher level. Um, so the talk will focus on three main topics, all of them related to deep brain stimulation. We are all here because we agree the brain is a wonderful organism, worth studying it, but very complex, and no single lab or investigator can actually comprehend the difficulty of it. And this was very nicely highlighted in the talk before lunch. But let's try to see what can we do, and actually what's been done for many decades now. What you see in this picture here is uh, Dr. Penfield, a neurosurgeon who poked with electrical uh, stimulation, but using superficial electrodes in cortex of uh, his epileptic patients. And by doing that, he was able to identify areas that would cause either sensation or motion. And this allowed him to map what's known today as the homunculus, areas in the brain that are directly related to some sort of behavior. And electrical stimulation was useful for clinical purposes, but even more so starting with early 1900s. So Dr. Penfield did his work mid-1900s, but early 1900s, the same stimulation was used in rodent models in the hypothalamus to elicit behavior. Um, it's a very old technique, and it taught us a lot. And now, fast forwarding to present day, it even found its usefulness in clinics. What you see here is a brain scan from a patient with Parkinson's disorder. And if you pay attention to the picture here, there's two depth electrodes, and you might see the very fine threads that go all the way to the deep nuclei involved in motor control. You implant those uh, electrodes in the brain, and then these are connected to a cable that goes under the skin and then goes to a pacemaker. And this pacemaker provides the energy to stimulate that depth nucleus at high frequency, 100 hertz, high energy. And miraculously, this takes care of the tremor. You have a Parkinsonian, um, severely Parkinsonian patient, you turn on the stimulation at 100 hertz, tremor ceases. Interestingly, if you do this at 20 hertz, tremor amplifies. Same brain area, same parameters, just the frequency change. Very complex things going on. It's a relatively new method. It was introduced initially for Parkinson in 93. And since then, it's been approved for an array of uh, disorders, mainly motor. And there are more than 100,000 patients uh, walking with this stimulator. Anybody in the audience? Or I'm asking because I saw a Medtronic stimulator at the uh, place where we had lunch by the <laughs> restroom. I have to admit, I've never seen this before. So Medtronic does the stimulators as well. So just seeing that, it hit very close to home. Um, and there's very um, advanced iterations now. A patient can control the stimulator, for example, turn it on and off, let's say if you go through a scanner, or if you drive an electrical car, or if so, for some reason you need it off or to save battery life. And let's see if this... Um, so like any serious researchers, when you have a research project or presentation to do, you go to reliable sources such as Wikipedia and YouTube, right? So let's check out the YouTube video to give you a bit of a real perspective on what this therapy does to a patient. And fingers crossed, this will work. Okay. So what you see... Pause it. So I explain what this is. It's a patient, and if you pay attention under the skin, this is the battery pack. It is implanted under the skin. The wire threads through the neck, and then the stimulator is in the brain. What he has in his hand is a magnet, and he's going to use the magnet to turn off the stimulator. And pay attention to what happens when the stimulator is off, to the speech to the gait and also the tremor of the, of the patient. So I'll just play it. Please listen to the sufferment. Two seconds. One, two. Stay tranquil. Now I'm with Paxson. Real. It's true. I'm not lying. This is not Michael, jo uh, Michael Fox. Com o cinto, com o limbo. Liga, liga. Isso aqui é parte. Agora vou ligar de novo. Eu não sei dar. Acredito. So this is real time. And what's amazing, we don't know how it works. 
it works so well. We don't know how it works. And common sense might say if it works, don't interfere with it. Um, however, there are some interesting side effects because of it. The electrode is placed in an area that has both motor fibers and fibers related to emotion and cognition. So some of the patients actually report if the current is not modulated enough or if the placement is not just right, they report some very disturbing side effects, such as desire to go to Las Vegas and gamble of their money. So impulse control becomes a problem. Um, inappropriate language in social settings as well, um, and they would rather not have that. Um, so this is one motivation to try to understand how it works. Um, there's been a lot of research, so uh, it's a complicated problem, that's why we don't understand it. So research, both from the basic science and clinical communities, have been describing this more and more. And furthermore, it could be that this stimulation could find its place not only in the motor spectrum disorder, but some others. For example, obsessive compulsive disorder, stimulation in the striatum nuclei, has been FDA approved in 2009. And there's been some clinical studies uh, showing that it could help for depression as well. So what's the major problem? Why don't we understand how it works? Here is um, what you have when you apply electrical stimulation to a cluster of neurons. Let's assume that these two neurons ha do different things. One is inhibitory, one excitatory. When you apply the electrical field to this area, you're going to get conflicting results, and you're going to get conflicting behavior. So the main limitation is that the stimulation itself, for clinical purposes, but also for basic research in neuroscience, doesn't allow for a good understanding of what you're exactly doing to the circuit to get that behavior. To bypass this challenge, optogenetic was developed uh, many years ago now. It started, it started many decades ago with groups in Germany that studied the microbial absence and then evolved and caught traction in the neuroscience community. And there's a very large effort across many labs international. So where are we now? We have a method that's called optogenetics. And what this allows us to do is to target these cells in a very specific fashion. So to give you an example for excitation, rather than modulating both of these um, neurons here the way you do with electrical stimulation, you can introduce conductance regulators. What these do, they alter the membrane potential of the neurons, and they result either in net activation or net inhibition, depending what ion your flux is and in what direction your flux is, fluxing it. So what you can do is to introduce these conductance modulators that are light-gated. So when they absorb photons, a pore opens in this case and allows a flux of sodium ions. Sodium ions happens to be excitatory for neurons, but there's many types of opsins. Um, in this case here, what you see is um, channelodopsin, which is one of the commonly used opsins for neuroscience. When you introduce this channel into the neuron and you apply the light, only and only the neurons that have the light and the protein will respond to the modulation, leaving the bystanders unaffected. And this is important because if you see a behavioral effect, you know that it was not directly due to this one, although it could be synaptically connected. The, the pairing tool many times is useful to know what happens if you don't have something. What if you block or lose a brain area due to an accident, due to neurodegeneration, what happens to your brain? Um, most studies uh, rely on either lesion or chemical ablation for this purpose, but this is not reversible, and it's rather limiting. So what you can do by using optogenetic tools is, again, to introduce inhibitory tools. In this case here, I'm picturing... Um, Natrodomonas pharaonis, which is a chloride pump. An influx of chloride into a neuron will shut off action potentials. So what you can do is to block entire nuclei in the brain and see what happens when you do that. And furthermore, you can stop the light, and then the activity returns and the behavior returns. So this allows you repeated experiments and also allows you to tighter the amount of light so you can inhibit more or less depending on your experimental goal. And almost conveniently, these two tools and many other options that have been described by people in the field have um, separated action spectra. So they don't respond to a discrete wavelength, they respond to Gaussians. But what you see here is that, let's say the peak for channel rhodopsin would be 470 and the peak for halo rhodopsin would be 570. So you could, in principle, if you tone them well, achieve inhibition and excitation in similar circuits. The origin of the absence is rather interesting and unlikely. 
which I would like to introduce it briefly only with this slide, because it points to the huge importance of basic research. We do hear a lot about clinical work nowadays, but sometimes the jumps are not obvious. So j let me give an example from microbial opsins. Um, the tools themselves, chanorhodopsin, halorhodopsin, and many others, come from very simple organisms, many times unicellular. For example, chanorhodopsin comes from Chlamydomonas reinhardti. Here, it's a green alga, and it's using the opsin to beat up this flagella and go towards food. Um, and there are many others, Natronomonas pharaonis, Volvox carteri for the others. The names are rather fancy, but it's not their fault. People name them, so just, they're stuck with them. So what we had to do was to take these genes and put them into um, experimental organisms, be it worm or fly or rodent or primates. Each one of them has its own uh, power, depending on the question. If you want to do genetics, you might be better off starting with flies or worms. If you want to do complex behaviors, primates. However, we encounter quite a bit of a challenge when we try to take these proteins because their origin is rather foreign, and the way they act in their host organism, it's not the way they will act in, an, in a transplanted way, right? So what we saw first was that the protein would aggregate and will kill the neurons, so it wasn't the, the desired effect. So we had to go at the level of the protein trafficking and try to alter the way the protein was trafficked into the membrane to make it work. And this has been uh, many years of work, but we have successfully done so now. And with the new absence to be discovered, those rules still apply. So there, there is a way to, to fix them. Now going back to the deep brain stimulation, how can we use... Um, optogenetic excitation or inhibition to understand more about how deep brain stimulation works. The first experiment was suggested by the fact that the initial literature pointed to the fact that inhibition of the target nucleus would be the mechanism of action. And this was due to the fact that lesioning this area or applying inhibitory drugs will alleviate tremor in Parkinsonian people. Um, so we tried this experiment where we put an inhibitory opsin into the depth nucleus. Um, the target, the target area is the subthalamic nucleus, or STN. And the way we do this in rodents is by using viral delivery. You can package the DNA that codes the protein for opsins into a virus and then inject it by using a depth needle into the area of interest. And the way you get cell type specificity can be via a promoter. In your DNA code, you also insert a, an instructive code, a, a way of a zip code that tells cells which ones are gonna make the opsins and which ones are not gonna make the opsin. So what you have here then is the expression of the opsin in the target nucleus, and then you can apply the light via a, a guide, a cannula guide. And to exemplify how good of an isolation you can get this way. If you use a CAMK2 promoter, which is a promoter for excitatory cells in this depth area, what you get is a genetically extracted pattern of excitatory cells embedded in a um, network of inhibitory. By comparison, this is what you would have in the equivalent experiment with an electrode. You put an electrode in the tissue, and the electrode is blind to the identity of these cells and these interactions. But if you instead use a promoter, you can target only the excitatory cells, um, and you can test the colonization by, by staining. Now, is this working? What you can do is to insert at the same time an electrode. So you use the fiber optic to deliver light, you flux the ions through the opsins, and then use an electrode to monitor the activity to see whether your neurons are excited or inhibited or unperturbed by the manipulation. And in this particular experiment, what electrical recordings um, with an extracellular electrode showed was that yes, you do get decreased inhibition. So to reiterate, the hypothesis was that you inhibit the nucleus and you should get amelioration of tremor. However, that's not what happened. And that's not what happened in many type of experiments that targeted only the cell bodies in the nucleus. So trafficking options of various identities to the cell bodies in the nucleus didn't affect the behavior. However, what did affect the behavior was to modulate the fibers, to modulate the axons in the nucleus and around the nucleus. And this, Thinking backwards, this is not that surprising because if we, if we look at a more expanded diagram of the basal ganglia, 
we can see that, yes, the electrode is in the STN, and a lot of the manipulations were done locally, but there are very long-ranging projections, some of them from the cortex, some of them from elsewhere, which could be affected by the electrical field. And the reason why we didn't test that was that we didn't have the tools. We didn't have the tools to only target the axons. Fortunately, one of the transgenic uh, rodents that was generated with channel rhodopsin um, happened to have very strong expression. So what you see here is the STN area, which is the depth nucleus, and had very strong expression in the fibers, but not so much so in the cell bodies. So by performing this manipulation in the cell bodies, um, excluding the cell bodies and by modulating the axons, we actually were able to restore the symptoms of Parkinsonian rodents. And when we recorded the, the firing, a very interesting pattern emerged. If you stimulated high frequency, remember what I mentioned at the beginning about the duality. High frequency stimulation erases tremor, low frequency amplifies tremor. So if we do these recordings in depth nuclei where axons primarily are being modulated, at high frequency you erase these um, fast firing cells, and at low frequency you just overimpose 20 hertz response. And this results in the, in the two uh, symptoms, less tremor or more tremor. Now the main question is, where are these axons for, from? Are there axons synapsing onto the cells or fibers of passage? And this is an important question because if their origin is superficial, remember the human brain, the electrodes were going all the way down. And there's many blood vessels. We've heard um, interesting questions about blood vessels today. There's many blood vessels in the waist. And the deeper you have to go, the more likely is that something is going to go wrong. So if these axons originate more superficially, that's something worthwhile um, investigating. So we were set to do this and try to understand where do these axons come from. And we trace them back by using dual um, recordings and um, with the optogenetics and recordings with the electrode. Uh, we trace the, the origin back to cortex, to the motor cortex where the cell bodies stay in layer 5. And then they send projections to the STN. And then one experiment that became obvious was, would you get the same effect if instead of having your stimulation in the STN on the axons of those cells, would you get the same effect if you have the stimulation superficially on the motor cortex? Um, and this is an example from one rodent that was uh, rendered Parkinsonian with the toxin. And this is the walking path without any stimulation. And this is the walking path with superficial cortical stimulation. So you can see that now the rodent can freely move. So now for a reality check, all I'm showing is in a mouse in a rat. It's like this, this brain versus this brain. What does it, does it have anything to do with the human disorder. Is this pathway, the pathway from cortex to the STN, even present in humans? Because if it's not, that's a game stopper right there. So fortunately, working in an interdisciplinary environment allowed us to communicate with some of the clinicians. And my collaborator on the project, Dr. Jamie Henderson, who leads the Deep Brain Stimulation Clinic at Stanford, um, he performed some very interesting imaging studies in his uh, patients that were candidates for DBS. And this is just one example of a scan from a human patient uh, where um, the experiment is like this. Um, the electrode for uh, recording and stimulating purposes is placed in the STN. And at the time of the stimulation, you can do two things. You can map the axons by using in vivo imaging, by diffusion tensor imaging. What this does is maps the alignment of water molecules around the tracks, and that allows you to see this nice bundles. And you might have seen this colored like a rainbow. So that's the source of those images. Um, and at the same time, you can place a recording array onto the cortex and see how is the cortex modulated by the presence of the electrode in the STN. And what Jamie um, noticed was that, yes, you do have this hyperdirect pathway, and he has a very interesting pattern. He has the sensory motor bundle here, but also has some fibers that are in the prefrontal area. So all those side effects might start to make sense if you have an electrode here and you're affecting all of these fibers. However, to try to parse this out in a, in a very detailed way, we are limited by our technology. Because what I'm showing here, it's all the same color. So you have this fiber bundles that are yellow go in the STN, but all of them have different molecular identities, different frequencies, and probably they're responsible for different things. And we would like to understand what all of those parameters are. And the first 
block, the first barrier we are encountering is how do you map long range projections while preserving the molecular identity? Conventional histology, which many of you have been exposed to, I hope, involves slicing. You slice 40 micrometer thick, and then you image each one, you stain each one, you put them side by side, and then you reconstitute your 3D volume. But this has some challenges with it, especially when you're hoping to map long-range projection as, uh, axons. The chance of misaligning or missing onto sparse cell populations is very high. So what you need, and it was briefly introduced in the talk prior, is a way to do imaging in the intact unsection volume. And fortunately, now we have um, a method that allows to do that. What I'm showing here is the method that's called clarity, but there are many different ways that involve taking, let's say, a fluorescent brain and soaking it into a media that matches the refractive index for your imaging. And that allows for the light not to scatter and allows you to image deeper into the tissue, because that's a problem. That's why you have to section it, because scattering will just mix up your wavefront. But this is not enough. You can image endogenous fluorescence, but what you want to do is also to stain and get phenotypical information. So this method, uh, and I'll explain how it's being done um, in a minute, what it allows you to do is not only image, but also diffuse probes in. Diffuse antibodies, diffuse mRNA probes, small dyes, and stain for a variety of cells. So for example, here is a 3D volume where there is endogenous fluorescence in green, and then there is the glial cells stained with GFAP in blue and the inhibitory cells in red. So you can start to see all of these different populations and their axons in vivo. And how is this possible? How can you do this? Um, we've heard about the lipids prior as being a, a key factor for, um, for brain activity and for, um, for ex ex um, exocytosis. However, in this case, the lipids are the ones that are impairing our ability to see deep in the tissue. The reason why we cannot image into the tissue is that the lipids are scattering the light. So what you want to do is to remove the lipids, but if you remove the lipids, your tissue is going to collapse. So you want to replace those lipids with something that will provide some support to the tissue. And the way this um, has been done in the case of this technique is to introduce monomers, acrylamide monomers, and then cross-link everything onto that lattice. All the proteins, all the cellular structure, you cross-link onto an acrylamide, uh, acrylamide matrix. And then you soak everything in SDS, which will form micelles with the lipids, and then you put the brain in an electrical field that pushes the lipids out. So what your end result is, is a brain that has no lipids, therefore no scattering elements, and the acrylamide secures everything into place. And this is, um, I'll show you a video, so you can appreciate the, the level of detail that you get by performing this technique. So this is from a transgenic animal, and for orientation, this is the cortex of the corpus callosum and the hippocampus. And again, this is not section, so this is one of those cortical columns. We're limited to a cortical column because of the field of view of the objective. And now you, we're gonna zoom onto it and remove optical sections, not physical sections. And pay attention to these fiber bundles here that would be rather difficult to realign if this video were to be obtained by 40 micrometer slices, individually imaged and stacked up. The technique is not without, um, it's a new uh, platform and it's not without its uh, challenges. So I'll mention some of them because my hope is that some of you would be interested to solve these problems. We are trying very hard to solve them in the lab and we don't have a solution yet. So this is something that with, I would say, just high school chemistry and biology and lots of enthusiasm and hard work could be done by you. Um, for example, this technique swells and shrinks the brain. How do you prevent this? How do you get antibodies to penetrate better? Think diffusion, think fluid dynamics, pressure. Electrical field browns the tissue, and this is a problem because GFP becomes not visible. And there's ways to reverse browning, for example, if you think about the diabetics literature and the chemicals used to prevent the Maillard reaction. However, for now, what we are relying on is passive diffusion on thick slices, which works very well. And we would also need a platform for imaging and reconstruction, again, pointing to the need for interdisciplinary research. People doing neuroscience might not be the most savvy optics people, but we need good microscopes and good software to, to go further. 
However, passive diffusion for now works. So there is a version of the method that works, which involves using um, coronal slices. Here what I'm showing is a one millimeter coronal slice. Here is not cleared. And here is a brain slice that was cleared. So it's still there, you just don't see it because it's transparent for optics purposes. And using this, you can start to stain for populations that are affected. For example, in a, a brain that suffers from Parkinson, you're going to start losing dopaminergic cells or cholinergic cells. And you can start to stain for this. And for example, here, there is a nucleus. And what we observed when we stained for cholinergic and dopaminergic cells was a very sparse population of dopaminergic cells that you could miss if you just sample this every few slides slices, you're going to miss on those fine populations, or you're going to miss on your fine structures if you do that. And I would like to open it even further, because the brain we've heard today, and it's probably going to be repeated over the, these two days of the symposium, the brain is not in a vacuum. It's in constant communication with the body, and the body is in constant communication with the brain. So we need to pay attention to the vasculature, to the blood flow, and to the peripheral innervations. And as an example, by using this tissue clearing and mapping technique, you could visualize blood vessels. So what you see here is a stain for glial um, cells, GFAP, and what you, it's highlighted, you might notice the edges. These are blood vessels. And then you can put in additional markers and understand more about the communication from vasculature to the cells. And to push it even a bit further, and then I'll stop there with the brain-to-body connection, I'll come back to the technology, there's been a lot of literature recently pointing to the relevance of my, the microbiome, or the gut microbiota. And by doing detailed imaging, just observation, Richard Feynman used to say, you can, see, you can learn a lot just by looking at the things, if you know where to look and what to look at. So what you see here is a cleared small intestine, and you can stain for bacteria, or you can stain for innervations, and try to see how these are affected in different um, disease paradigms. Okay. All I've mentioned until now in the context of tissue clearing was from this paradigm. You make an exoskeleton. You remove the lipids, but then you make an exoskeleton onto the cells to support the structure. What's interesting, though, is that this project started with a different flavor. The initial concept was to make an endoskeleton, which means let's make the neurons strong so then we can functionalize and endure them. And I think this is just a nice exploratory example, especially at this stage where you're trying to see where your science and your curiosity will take you. So let's do a plain cell culture biological exercise where... In culture, if you have a neuron, that's a very susceptible structure. It's susceptible to everything. Temperatures, changes, acid, water. So if you drop some water onto the cell, it's going to burst. It makes for a very interesting uh, scene. You put water, everything explodes. It's quite fun. has the fancy name of hypotonic lysis. So the concept was, let, let's do something to, to this neuron that's not PFA because PFA is not genetically encoded, that's not paraformaldehyde, it's not a fixative. Let's do something that's genetically encoded, so when you drop that water, it doesn't explode anymore. And let's not ask why for now, just do it because it's fun. This explodes, let's not make it explode. And the initial experiments uh, tested an array of very strong polymers in nature. For example, chitin, this was a concept, chitin is a very strong polymer in nature, and it's made from this monomers, from n glucosamine which is present in neurons. It's interesting, it's present in neurons, what its function is, um, and, but it doesn't have the synthesis, the chitin synthase to make the filaments. So the first idea was let's try to make the neurons strong by using chitin. And um, as a, I would like to tell you about the doing of science, not only the results of science. At that time, we really needed a positive control, and the company couldn't ship us the positive control fast enough. So what you see here is data from a moth, that was caught in, um, in the office. Um, and moths, they have uh, chitin in their wings and legs, so the antibody did work. We could find the chitin in the positive control, but we never found it in neurons, even if we were supplying the synthase, the enzyme. Um, and then we went on and tried other polymers, and none of them was working well um, until uh, something interesting happened. Um, at that time, I was uh, in a phase in my life where I was thinking a lot about nails. 
not for the reasons you might think of, um, cutting my baby's nails was a challenge. Like, never the right clippers or the right magnifier or the right baby. So, um, but they were frail. And in the end, we just dropped everything and used filing, right? But all this thinking about nails, and we started thinking about keratins, like, why are nails hard? Keratin makes them hard. They produce healthy epithelial cells, produce keratin, and when they have enough to fill it, they lose their nucleus, and they undergo apoptotic death, and then they're strong and last forever. Um, however, neurons have these very big processes, beautiful dendrites and ramifications. You want to fill all of that. But hey, keratin does this very well. It is filamentous. If you choose the right pair. So... The search was for a pair of keratins that would do that. If you express individual keratin filaments, they're rather spotty, but they work in pairs. You need one acidic and one basic, and if you express the right pair, the result is rather surprising. You can fill entire neurons with keratin filaments that would go away onto the processes. Um, and it will even highlight spines. What is this good for? I don't know, maybe you'll find a use for it. Um, for now, it could be a way to mark degenerating cells. So we've talked a lot about dying cells. Um, the problem is that once they die, they vanish. So you can only notice the absence of something, but it would be very good to know the presence. Where was that cell that died when it died? We don't know that because we base our experiments on the lack of something or the lack of the cell bodies and the processes are very difficult to assess. However, tissue clearing with all of its strengths is still dead tissue. And in the brain, there's all the subtlety that's due to the activity. And we want to be able to understand the activity of the brain, ideally at the large scale. And electrophysiology, which is the traditional method how this was done, it's, it's difficult to scale it up, especially for deep brain structures where it's based on electrodes. And more and more now there's a revival of optical imaging and genetically encoded sensors. And for calcium, calcium is a way to image neuronally uh, cells that are, have been activated. Um, and calcium sensors are very good, but they cannot um, distinguish fast firing frequencies because their kinetics are rather slow. So what is some of the work uh, from, from our group and others, actually? There's been a lot of activity recently in the, in the sensing field. The need is for a sensor that can alterate its uh, emission, its photon emission, based on the membrane voltage. And ideally, it would be genetically encoded. So the, the name for them is JEVIS, or genetically encoded voltage indicators. And what this would allow you is to target them into cell types of interest and then image those cell types and know their, not only their activity, but their identity because they were genetically encoded. So the story with the opsins, we go back to it because it's a beautiful story. This opsins that have been discovered decades ago, it turns out that they have another interesting property. Not only when they absorb photons, they can flux ions, and those ions alter the membrane voltage, which results in inhibition or excitation of the neuron. But what they can do is to absorb the photons and then emit photons back. And that emission would be a function of the membrane voltage. And this is a property that has been discovered by Adam Cohen at Harvard and reported in a beautiful paper, Nature Methods, where an opsin, archaerodopsin in this case, arch, is expressed in culture neurons, will emit fluorescence, and the fluorescence will change as a function of voltage. So what you see here is a current injection recorded with conventional electrophysiology, so a glass, a glass pipette that's poked into the cell and records the currents. And you can see that with the current injection here, you get precise activity from the neurons. And your imaging signal tracks it with very good temporal fidelity. However, the signal is too modest to be used for in vivo purposes. So what we set up to do in our lab is to amplify this fluorescence. The kinetics is very good, but to use it in vivo, you want to amplify the fluorescence. And this goes back to basic protein engineering in a high-throughput manner and high-throughput screens. And neurons are just not good at that. You cannot do high-throughput experiments quick in uh, neurons. So we teamed up with the lab of Francis Arnold um, at Caltech, who's in chemistry and chemical engineering. And we've used E. coli to screen for fluorescent opsins. Um, and what you see here 
I guess ignore the details, but you see an array of opsins that depending on their mutations, they can emit more or less fluorescence. And that fluorescence is pH dependent. So we took the ones that were emitting the most fluorescence in a pH dependent way, and we, we moved them into neurons. We had the usual challenges with survivability, targeting to the membrane, so we had to work through those. But we ended up with a restricted array of opsins that would emit more as a response to voltage changes. Now remember, opsins flux ions, so for a sensor, you don't actually want to alter your neuronal state while you're imaging. So the ideal tool will emit a lot of fluorescence that voltage dependent, but wouldn't flux ions. So it was important for us to patch, to measure the currents through those cells, and show that most of the mutants that had high fluorescence are actually not fluxing ions. So they will be a good and accurate sensor. And then we, we set it to an easy test where we step the membrane voltage a very, a very large step from minus 150 millivolts to plus 150 millivolts. And what you see here is the electrode recording, and here's the corresponding fluorescence emitted by the cell. So you can see that it steps back and forth and back and forth. This shows you that the signal is amplified. It doesn't show you how good the kinetics is. So then we did the next experiment where we inject action potentials to see can you track, can you monitor fast action potentials with good signal and kinetics. So, and I'm almost done. And what you see here, if you, unfortunately the quality of the projector is not bad. No, no, no. This is a cell spiking at you at 20 hertz. It is slowed down. You see the time scale in the corner, so you can see it. So you can see a neuron being activated. And this is the quantification here. Because the signal is good, what you see is that you can also detect the changes onto dendrites, which is very useful. Patching a dendrite is something very hard to do. I tried to do it and failed many years, and I'm very jealous of people that do this. There's a few people in the world that can patch dendrites, not myself. So to wrap up and put things in context, years from now on, we hope we'll understand more about this long-range projection and the activity. We're we'll be, going to be confused at a higher level, as it was said. And I do have to acknowledge my wonderful lab for being very hardworking and sending me data and questions even as we speak. Um, Nick and Claire worked on the voltage sensors, and Ben with Chung Khan worked on the tissue cl clearing. Um, our collaborators, Martin in Francis Arnold's lab on the initial E. coli, and my training lab, um, the Dysrod um, lab at Stanford, my colleagues and also my mentor, Carl Dysrod, and a lot of the support for which our work would then be possible. And so I'll sum up by saying that it's important to understand the brain, especially for reasons that were mentioned before. People live longer, fewer are born, so our population pyramid is going to look like this, and these brains, as it was said before, some of them will have dementia, and we, this is a problem that we are all going to need to tackle. Um, so, um, I think it's time for, yeah, time for questions and for work. So, thank you.